Now for today's program, which is in commemoration of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Marian Ein Lewin was born in Amsterdam, Holland, now the Netherlands, in 1938 and survived the concentration camp Bergen-Belsen together with her mother and father and twin brother Stephen Hess. Now, almost 80 years later, Marion and Stephen are believed to be the only surviving twins from the camp and, according to all available data, one of the very few surviving twins of the Holocaust. Their story is detailed in the new book, Inseparable, The Hess Twins' Holocaust Journey Through Bergen-Belsen to America by Ferris Cassell. Marion and her brother have spent the last several years helping Ferris in the research and due diligence for this book about their family and the impossible odds of their survival during the Holocaust. Dr. Michael Berenbaum is a writer, lecturer, and teacher, consulting in the conceptual development of museums all over the world and the development of historical films. He is the director of the Siggy Ziering Institute, exploring the ethical and religious implications of the Holocaust at the American Jewish University, where he is also a distinguished professor of Jewish studies. Dr. Berenbaum served as project director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, overseeing its creation, and was the director of its research institute. He also served as president and CEO of the Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation, which took the testimony of 52,000 Holocaust survivors in 32 languages and 57 countries. His work in film as a historical consultant has won both Emmy and Academy Awards. Dr. Berenbaum is the author and editor of 22 books, scores of scholarly articles, and hundreds of journalistic pieces, and he has been featured on many television news programs. Please welcome Marion Ein Lewin and Michael Berenbaum. First of all, I want to welcome Marion uh, to this program. I want to say a word of tribute to my host. I am old enough to have been a continuous subscriber to Moment through its entire existence and its multiple iterations. And it's a uh, it's a journal that's uh, and a magazine that's uh, got a very unique and very wonderful and distinguished place in Jewish life. And I urge those of you who are listening to the program to consider it. It also welcomes various points of view and can't be typecast into one category or another, which I can't say about most publications these days. Uh, we have a wonderful opportunity because Marion uh, Lewin has such an incredible experience. And this is such a wonderful uh, book. I'm going to begin, uh, Marion, by asking you how the book came into being. And I guess the other half of it, Marion, is that um, I interviewed about a year and a half ago a man by the name of um, uh, Guy Stern, who was a German Jewish refugee and one of the interrogators at Nuremberg, later became provost of a um, series of major universities. And I asked him a question because he wrote his autobiography at 99. You're quite a bit younger than that. But what took you so long to tell the story and tell us how the book came into being? Okay. Um, well, I never really thought about writing uh, a book about the Holocaust, although, of course, my history and my life uh, makes it part of my every day, but somehow I, I never wanted to be totally defined by it. And I also knew that there were so many other people writing uh, about the Holocaust. Um, so, you know, my career, I wrote about healthcare policy, and I also like to write about um, other things I've done in my life. So I have a file in my computer called um, uh, you know, thoughts from Mary and Lewin, but it talks more about travel and art and things that move me. Uh, but of course, this has been such a privilege uh, to have this book, um, to have it here for our family and our future family to read. And I must congratulate uh, Ferris Castle, who I actually only met about three months ago because she wrote this book during the time of COVID. So the only way we communicated actually was through um, Zoom and, you know, kind of conversations on the telephone. So how did this book happen? Um, you know, at the height of COVID, and I think of this Passover, I thought about the first responders to COVID, these people 
who you know didn't know how deadly COVID was, what risks they were taking, taking care of these people who were terribly ill, and it was kind of their their courage, their empathy, their humanity. I was very impressed with those people. And all of a sudden I had, I remember people in the camp and I focused particularly on my parents, but there were others who amidst those impossibly to describe situations, so much tragedy, so much brutality and inhumanity still maintained a level of hope, a level of dignity, a level of courage and a level of still caring about other people. And all of a sudden, I, you know, it sparked in my mind that there was this common bond. And so just because I felt like it, I, I, read, I wrote an essay and uh, I showed it to someone and they said, this really should be published somewhere. Um, in any case, it ended up in the LA Times. Um, this was in April 2020. And it was uh, called um, My Childhood Memories of the Holocaust in a World of COVID. So I, I, I made that um, comparison. And in that uh, op-ed piece, the, the editor of the op-ed section of the LA Times said, well, we should include a picture. And I said, well, do you want a picture of, of me and my brother as we look now? Or do you want a picture of the way it looked then? I mean, we were there six years old. And he, she said, no, no, send a picture of the way we look then. And so I sent her a picture that was taken by a photographer about four months before we were picked up and we're in Dutch costumes, it's in the book and I could hold that up at some point. And the costumes, we had a nanny at the time who was very devoted and very special. And she came from a small fishing village where they wore native costumes. And she always asked my parents, can we take a picture of the twins in native costume? Uh, and, um, my parents finally relented and she bought costumes from her fishing village that her family had made. And so here's the picture of us in these Dutch costumes. And someone, a reader, recognized the costumes because you have these native costumes, although they all look similar, different parts of the country do variations on a theme, either the embroidery or the shape of the bib. And someone was reading it and said, oh, they're wearing an Urker, which meant we were wearing costumes that came from Urk. I had never even heard of that city or village. It turns out to be a fishing village, not far from Amsterdam, where our nanny, Marietta, came from. So that was a piece of history that I never knew. And so she immediately contacted the mayor of Urk uh, about this picture and this article. And he also happened to be the historian of that city. And so he knew everyone and everything about this little town. And you know, within two days, uh, I had records of where we lived in Amsterdam, of Marietta's family. It was, it was quite astonishing. And so um, a Pulitzer Prize nominated journalist, Stephen Lopez, uh, read the story and he was fascinated. And so he said, I'm going to investigate this. I'm going to talk to some people in Urk. And about a year later, um, he wrote a very long page one article, which was called, um, A Newspaper Photo Unlocks History for Two Holocaust Survivors. And so that was astonishing because he brought facts and kind of a context to our story, which we had never known, including you know this this uh, more information about this wonderful nanny who was part of our lives, um, and and other things. And I think kind of the most poignant thing about that was he was able to meet with Marietta's daughter, Ellen. Um, and she told Steve Lopez, she said, my mother, when she was a nanny, she loved her job. And when 
when she had a special bond with the children she took care of, she even named some of her children after them. That's why I have the sister called Marion, uh, which is of course my name, and that was very touching. So I know this is a very long answer, but as a result, um, a, uh, a scout for a publishing company contacts Steve and said, this would make an amazing book. And that's really how the ball and, started. And, and you, got, you got to Ferris uh, uh, Cassell. Let me just, uh, I've worked with Ferris for, yes. um, for several, a lot of seven years. Um, uh, Ferris um, uh, wrote a, uh, Ferris is um, half journalist, half marvelous detective. Um, she wrote a, a, an absolutely fascinating book, which is a combination of description and detective work. Um, somebody, get, her husband is a physician. She's not Jewish. He is Jewish. Somebody gave her a um, letter that was sent to somebody then in Chicago uh, from Germany asking for them to sponsor them. Their name was Berger. It was Berger. This was a non-Jewish Berger. And uh, the letter was never answered. And she went on to discover um, who the family was in Chicago, who the family was in Germany, where they were spread out all over the world, and was able, in fact, to reunite the family and to write a description of this uh, with, uh, in this marvelous book called Unanswered uh, Letters which I got because she is the same agent uh, that I use, uh, who's uh, my good friend, and I know is a friend of yours, Ron Goldfarb, who's now um, probably uh, in his early 90s, but still um, doing his work and doing it uh, very well. So how'd you come to, if Ferris look, found you or you found Ferris, because you found one whale of a researcher. <laughs> Well, you know, that book I hear took her about 12 years, an enormously long time, and it was the first book she wrote. Um, this one took about two, uh, but she did an amazing amount of research. Um, Ferris was unknown to me. The publisher asked Stephen Lopez, uh, asked him first because he had written this long article, whether he was interested. And he said, it is a fascinating story, but he was working on his own book. And so then um, they talked to us about Ferris Castle. And you know, it happened, I, just, I, I said, I don't read that many Holocaust books and that's true, but I had read that book because it had been highly recommended and it is a fascinating book. And so that's how Ferris, I, I had never heard of her, I mean, except I knew she wrote this book. And she introduced herself and, you know, we hit it off and we had a very close relationship, distant because it was COVID. So it was at our first book event after the book came out last September in Atlanta that I actually met Ferris. So Marion, uh, everybody uh, is interested in knowing, the, they, they obviously have not yet read the book as I've been privileged to do. Uh, you didn't uh, begin your life in Bergen-Belsen. Take us through the basic narrative of your story because that too is absolutely fascinating. It's both a description of you and your brother and your parents, but also a description of the fate of, uh, of a Dutch jury. Yes. And in many yeah. respects, also also your parents were your parents were born in Germany. So start at the start at the very beginning and give us. Uh, a little bit of, of okay. the, the arc yeah. of the narrative, and then we'll go into particulars. Okay. Uh, my parents were born in Germany. My father was born in a, in a small Fulda, um, which had a very considerable Jewish, religious Jewish population. And he was really a horse and cattle dealer. He always wanted to be a high school teacher, but he always had to make a living. Um, and there were four children, so that's how he made his living. Uh, and he ran away from home at a very early age, at about 17. He found um, his life too constricted. He had a very strict father. Uh, and so he decided 
to go into the wider world uh, in Germany and became actually a successful businessman in the textile industry. My mother came from uh, a, a well-off family, you know, kind of her father managed the, the large department store in uh, Recklinghausen. And they were the lay leaders of the Jewish community in Recklinghausen. They were very highly respected. My father, who was considerably older than my mother, uh, came to Recklinghausen actually to do business um, to in, in this textile world. And it was the, the custom at that time for kind of a leader in the community to invite the visitor for lunch. And it turns out that my father always also that evening had a blind date with, it turns out, my mother's best friend. And uh, so my mother joined them for lunch. And, you know, what I heard, it was love at first sight. He never went on his blind date. Uh, and they, of course... Um, we, have to, we have to say your beautiful mother. Yes, she was very, very wasn't, beautiful. Wasn't wasn't easy wasn't easy to ignore her beauty and wasn't easy to uh, not be impressed by her presence that's, that's, presence and yeah. since we're talking since we're talking in uh, historical terms uh the people in the me too movement can can uh what uh, forgive us for talking in such terms um so in any case um uh, they got married and it was already at a time when Hitler was coming to power. I think that they must have seen the writing on the wall. Uh, my father, they were, they felt very assimilated in Germany. It was, they felt to some degree, I think, more German than, than Jewish. It wasn't that they didn't honor all the high holidays, but they felt very comfortable. And of course, they were also upper middle class. And, you know, they had a feeling we can wait this out, we'll find a way, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, but then at some point, of course, they did see the writing on the wall. But then, of course, you know, a lot of opportunities were already closed to get to America, or to get to safety. And so they moved to Holland with, with, you know, many other German Jews, usually upper class or business people, and Frank and her family moved to Amsterdam. And there was this expectation in the beginning that Holland would remain neutral because it was neutral in World War I. They didn't expect that it would be invaded uh, by Germany and very quickly defeated. And my let, me, let me interrupt for only one second to make a, a slight historical point. The presumption was that Germany wanted to get rid of its own Jews, but there was not a perception at that point of German expansionism. And consequently, nobody imagined they would come into Holland. Think also of Otto Frank, who found safety in Holland, or thought he found safety in Holland, and he left immediately when Hitler came to power. But um, your, your grandparents ended up coming, what, to the United States? Well, on my father's side. On your father's side, right. Your, yeah, they ended your, up patern coming. your paternal grandparents. Right. Um, some of them, um, one of my first cousins, uh, my uh, father's sister ended up going to Denmark and then Sweden, and they still live there. His younger brother ended up in Israel. We were the only ones who actually ended up in, in a concentration camp. I want to tell you just a, a short story about my grandfather, my mother's father, who, as I said, was a very highly respected um, leader of um, Recklinghausen. And during Kristallnacht, he was head of the board and he saw the synagogue in flames. And he, along with other leaders, ran to the synagogue to see what they could do. Of course, it was beyond redemption. Uh, and he was actually imprisoned uh, for uh, 
one or two weeks when they released him um, because he was Jewish and, and obviously was a leader of this congregation. My grandfather then, because they didn't have a synagogue, he decided to devote a room in his house. They lived in a, in a large house to um, a place of worship for the Jews. And in the beginning, it was a simple room. There wasn't much in it, but over time, I'm not talking about years because that the Jewish community, of course, didn't last that long. But within a year, he made it into a really beautiful room with books and artifacts. And that's where people worshiped actually in my mother's house. Uh, and, and, then, he did, and he decided to stay because he felt that it was his obligation as a leader. He did, yes. My parents begged them to come to Holland and he said, no, I want to stay with my um, my Jewish community. He died untimely. I mean, not long after Kristallnacht of a heart attack. And I think it was all the stress. I mean, what happened then, of course, is that Many people moved into their house because the Nazis said, you know, you don't need all that square footage. And so people who had their houses taken moved in. So it was a very difficult time. My, um, my grandparents got a pass to visit Amsterdam for eight hours. That was including the transport going. And that was when we were three months old, they got a day pass. And we do have a lovely picture of uh, my brother and I with our grandparents. So um, let's, I, let's go back to you now. You and your brother, your brother's name is Stephen, but it was then Stefan. Um, you and your brother are born as uh, upper middle class children uh, in an independent uh, Holland. You have a, a early memories of a, of a relatively nice life. And then all of a sudden it changes on uh, May 10th, uh, 1940. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, people ask and rightfully so, they say you were so young. How do you have those memories? And my brother have I discussed, even before the book was in anyone's mind, you know, we, we, we never really talked a great deal about our background. Um, when we were young, when we came to America, my parents felt that they were so blessed um, to be able to come to America. And they always said, you know, the world doesn't owe you a living. Um, you owe America your best efforts because you were able to come to this democracy, this land of freedom. I'm not father, my parents were amazing, um, you know, loyal um, and appreciative of coming here. So we never really talked that much about the Holocaust, uh, but I have, but it was later in my life when my mother moved here that we used to have long conversations because they lived across, she lived across the street, my father passed away. But what was really wonderful in a way, our memories, I had very clear memories of certain things, very clear memories of the night that we were picked up uh, by the police, uh, you know, very clear memories of how all of a sudden life seemed gloomy instead of sunny, that people, you know, kind of didn't greet each other happily, but everyone was was busy doing things. I remember the memory of having suitcases packed in front of, of, of the front door because um, in front of our apartment, because people knew that any day their number was up. My brother, um, he remembered everything about the you know the the cars that came to raid the apartments uh the nazi cars what they drove um and he kind of remembered all the mechanics the the planes and you know for his whole life he's loved planes and trains and automobiles so he had clear memories about that and then of course my father wrote this detailed memoir 
Uh, and so it was, in a way I was appreciative that I don't remember that when we came here that we devoted you know, our lives to talking about what had happened to us. Uh, but there were these pieces that kind of came together and, and you know, kind of filled in the story. But the people listening to the program want take us through your, you lived in Amsterdam, the Nazi, the, the Germans invaded. I'm using Germans in particular because invasion is an active state. Germans invaded, your life is turned upside down. And when you say little gestures, and I, I want to pick up on what you remember, uh, the idea that you have a suitcase ready to leave um, already tells us that your father and mother had no illusions as to how bad the situation was going to be. Right. Your father develops a strategy which he thinks is going to keep you guys um, from being deported. Let me just say historically, um, Jews were deported from Amsterdam to a transit camp, Vesterbrook. And then every Tuesday, um, beginning in 1942, a train left from Vesterbrook either to uh, Sobibor or to um, Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And the people who went to Sobibor, the survival rate was zero. And the people who went to Auschwitz, the survivor rate may have been 10%, uh, probably less than that. Uh, so for young children, you know, they and for young, chil young children, the survival rate would have been um, zero. But right. tell us your father's strategy to maneuver his own situation and your situation as a family um, in Amsterdam under occupation, even as deportations are beginning. Right, right. Well, you know, my father was actually um, in Germany, he worked for a prominent textile company, Verinetica Zeider. They ended up, we learned later, making the parachute cloth, you know, for the war effort. But they, and they, he was kind of an executive, not a most senior, but he had a high position. And it was actually that company who um, offered my father to do the same job in Holland. Um, so my father was one of the few people who was actually offered a job in Holland. And that's another reason why, of course, they they left and but when it turned out and by the way that's not merely a, that's not a promotion that's a lifeline a lifeline exactly that's, that that's uh, again right uh, somebody in the company understood how dangerous it was going to yes. be somebody in the company cared for him right somebody in the company thought about him and they offered him what was not possible for almost any other immigrant which is at least a lateral trend, uh, a lateral transition, so he could maintain his standard of living and and his occupation and everything right. else. So right. even that, even that is an incredible is an incredible moment. It is an incredible moment. Now, as it turned out, when he moved to Holland, the job wasn't available. So what happened in the interim? You know, did they? someone say, well, you can't give this job to a Jew or, I mean, something happened so that when we arrived in, well, you know, he came before we were born and then my, father, my mother followed a few months later and we were born in 1938, but it turned out that he didn't have that job. He didn't get that job, uh, but he, you know, he, they thought about ways of of escaping. We had tickets for a ship um, out of England, and we actually tried to go and and get to the ship by taking first of course a, sh uh, a ship from from Holland to England, and they stopped us at the borders. We were not allowed to get on the ship, and so we were back in Amsterdam. It turned out that that ship was blown up. I mean, so it's so amazing. And, and I only realized that since the book came out and we focused almost for two years on every fact and every page that had been written, 
uh, you know, it's kind of extraordinary turn of events. Um, you know, we're like playing musical chairs for a thousand times. I don't know if kids do musical chairs, but you know, you, you have to have a seat when the music stops. And I, I liken it to that sometimes. I say, how often did the music stop and we all had a chair? So this was another one. And then my parents, you know, a lot of people went into hiding and my mother explained to us, it was very difficult to find a hiding place for two toddlers or young children because they certainly aren't gonna stay quiet the whole day. So that was you know, a difficult thing. And then of course, um, a lot of children were sent to places like Indonesia or were taken into the homes of Indonesians living in, in Holland. Indonesia was then a colony still of Holland. And my mother tells the story that she contacted an agency and someone came and of course, you know, didn't look like them. It was Indonesian and spoke with a heavy accent. And my, my mother just couldn't make that commitment. I, I think at some point they decided it was going to be all of us together. and. You know, certainly feel and that, that. that again, that that's one of the powers of the title of the book, Inseparable. Yeah. Which is the family decided uh, and and it's an incredible decision, and your parents were able to pull it off that the family would remain together. Yeah. And yeah. that made and the other part of it is you and Stephen be, and Stefan being twins only meant that if you appeared outside, you always got more attention than anybody else because twins get more attention, you know. At as, that time, as, there didn't seem to be so so many twins. I mean, then it was still a little bit unusual, but it's interesting over the years, um, I mean, many years now, of course, almost 80, um, when people who are also survivors of Bergen Belsen uh, they remember, you know, oh, the little twins, because we were unusual that that we were twins, and people think of us as as the little twins. And I mean, I really feel that my parents felt that they couldn't have survived; they wouldn't have the will to survive if we went there. And of course, if they weren't there there was very little chance that we would have survived. So I think in a way, that was another inseparable bond. So your father begins to work for the Jewish community. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, he had these connections. I mean, of course, that's what people, you know, they just wanted to uh, stay alive. And of course, you know, there have always been stories, you know, these, these Jews, um, collaborate with the Nazis or, I mean, I I never saw any, I mean, there are stories, but I think my father, you know, people were, they were fun, they were looking for a pass to prevent them from being deported from week to week and month to month. You know, there wasn't any long-term, it was just, how do we, not get deported, you know, next week or next Let, month. Let's, let's let's help with that by saying your goal is not to get deported because instinctively they understood, and your father probably had a little bit deeper knowledge. Uh, deportation, um, your chances of survival go down astronomically. Uh, but uh, so the strategy is to avoid deportation. The tactics have to change almost by the hour. And part of the drama of, of the story as it's being told is we see all of the different ways in which they tried to avoid deportation. Yeah. Eventually, eventually your parents and you were deported to Vesterbrook. Right. I mean, the writing was on the wall, but here's another kind of miraculous story the fact is, you know, we were we were picked up in in uh, 1944. If we would have been picked up in 1942 or 1943, or you know, 
everyone, there were only trains going to Sobibor and Auschwitz. So we would have, that would have been the end of us. Bergen Belsen, people didn't even know about Bergen Belsen because it came online as a concentration camp later on. And I remember in Vestibor, a lot of conversations, you know, because these trains came every week and the night before all the names were called out. And of course, those were very tra traumatic and tragic evenings because people, of course, had no idea where they were going. And at that time, you know, it was only so we were Auschwitz. Uh, my father actually, and my father said, you, you never kind of had control over where you could go. I mean, you, my father didn't think that you could influence, but my father said, let's try to get to Bergen-Belsen because it's in Germany, it's not in Poland. I speak German, I'll know where I am. Uh, and, 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 and let me explain historically, Bergen-Belsen came into existence. Uh, it was a multiple type of camp, but it, it had a very specific role. And that is German POWs were captured and the German foreign minister thought that they might have to exchange in order to receive German POWs back, they might have to exchange prisoners. And therefore there was a section of Bergen-Belsen that was reserved for people who might be used in a prisoner exchange. Uh, and, but if you went to Auschwitz, you and Stephen would have been selected and your mother would have gone with you, no question about it. Uh, and you would have been dead because children your age did not survive. Or worse than that, almost worse than that, you would have been selected by Dr. Mengele for the experimentation on twins. Right. Sobobor, 100% of the Jews who, who uh, went to Sobor were killed upon arrival. The survival, the survival rate in Sobobor was less than one-tenth of one percent. 99.99 uh, nine of the people who arrived in Sobor were dead. Your only chance of survival becomes Bergen-Belsen. Yeah. And in Bergen-Belsen, ironically, you end up in a place, and for those of us who know Holocaust stories, this seems Bizarre, you end up in a place where, how are you living in Bergen Belsen? Tell us that story. How were we, well, we were in the Sternlager, uh, which means the star camp, which in a way it was, you know, a more privileged, there were so many sub camps. And, you know, what was the major tragedy in the end of Bergen Belsen was, of course, at the end of the war, it became so overcrowded that very few people could survive and there were this huge typhus epidemic. So in the beginning, it was, you know, livable. What can I say? My father was in another camp. He wasn't together with us. But I'm, I remember in the early days, there was even a little informal kindergarten, but then things uh, declined and, you know, there was no food and there was rampant diseases. So I now have to tell you, you know, one of the amazing stories of my life is that so many of the puzzle pieces, things I did not know, have only, um, I've only known about them in the last 10 years. My, my parents didn't know about them. I mean, the whole thing about IRC and, and here's one that's even more astonishing. About eight years ago, it was actually the, the night of um, uh, Break the Fast. And I always have a Break the Fast. So I was just trying to get a little bit of rest. Someone calls me from the Polish embassy and says, are you Marian Ein Lewin? Please don't hang up on me. Well, of course I was gonna hang up on him because who is this person? And you know, I have things to do, but he says, no, please. And then he said, was your father Karl Hess? Was your mother Ilse Hirschberg? Were you born in Amsterdam? Was your father born in Fulda? Was your mother born in, um, in Recklinghausen? I and mean, he knew all the facts. And what you happened- You wonder for a moment, how does somebody know that about me? <laughs> so how did, yeah. And he says, well, I have to tell you something. 
what has come available just, I guess, in months previous, although they had a sense that there was a list of this Polish diplomat who was operating in Bern, Switzerland. Um, you know, it was a delegation. It wasn't the official embassy in London. It was a delegation. And there was Konstantin Kondryki, who was um, plagiarizing or falsifying these false passports, which he bribed the Paraguayan consul in Switzerland to give him. And he forged the names. And we had one of these passports, Paraguayan passports. And at first, the Germans you know, couldn't figure out how to deal with people with Paraguayan passports. And tragically, the first 400 of them were distributed in the Warsaw Ghetto. And the people were taken out, taken to France, put in a monastery and thought, oh my God, we have a new chance of life. And at the last moment, the Nazis looked at these people and said, you know, they don't speak Spanish, they don't look Spanish or you know, um, Latin American, and they were all sent back and, and died in Auschwitz. But the second contingent who got these passports were Jews from Belgium and Holland, where they had an intermediary um, to actually, you know, hand over the applications. So it was more targeted. And we had these Paraguayan passports. And that is why we ended up in Bergen-Belsen because the people that they wanted to use as, as potential exchange prisoners were sent to Bergen-Belsen. And my father, you know, after the war, when I, we kept on asking why, how did we end up in Bergen-Belsen? We were young children, we were destined to go to the death camps. And my father said, well, we applied for those Paraguayan passports, but they never arrived. The story about that is those passports were sent to people's homes in Amsterdam weeks and months after they were already picked up. But the Nazis had copies of the lists. So this we discovered. So the reason why they called is this Konstantin Kondryki, this hero who I consider saved our lives, died as a pauper in Bern, Switzerland. He never went back to Poland. And then they discovered how heroic he was. And so the president of Poland was coming uh, to Switzerland to give him a hero's burial and to put him in a very kind of prominent place in the cemetery. And I, as a Holocaust survivor, they wanted me to, um, to come. So I went to that ceremony. My twin brother refused to go because I'm not going anywhere that's associated with Poland, but I really felt when I stood at his grave, his new beautiful grave, I thanked him. You know, he kept us alive and we, we didn't know that until less than 10 years ago, which is another amazing piece of the puzzle. And um, tell, tell us a little bit um, about, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you, it's a, it's a cruel question, but it's going to be one of the easiest ways for you to describe um, life in Bergen-Belsen. Tell us about playing with lice. Yep. Well, we played with a lot of things, but one of our favorite occupations was playing with lice because we realized that when you kind of killed them, they made a like a, a little firecracker. You know, they were just they made noise. So we would pull them out of our hair and line them up and we would kind of compete who would put them in, in the straightest line. So, um, you know, that was certainly, you know, I remember that for our sixth birthday, my father sold uh, a ring he had so that he could buy us two pieces of bread with chocolate sprinkles. Um, they were called, uh, Hachenslag or Moisius. It was a favorite child's food in Holland. And, you know, he was able to buy two slices of bread and chocolate sprinkles. And we spent uh, but I, I, I want, our, I want uh, the people with us to understand something. Two slices of bread in Bergen-Belsen were a quarter of a fortune. Yeah. 
and that is that 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 everybody's conversation was done by you know you and I use the word hungry but it means uh, I'm ready for lunch. Uh, yeah. They got hungry in forty two. They ate again in forty five, and that might have killed them. So yeah. hunger was a daily occurrence. Hunger, thirst, cold. Uh, all of all of that. So when you say your father sold two slices of bread for no, that was uh, the cooking, best I've ever had. only 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 in a camp can you understand what's involved in that. Yeah. And probably the chocolate um, Ferris, who's a great detective, in addition being a wonderful writer, Ferris says probably that had to do with. Uh, contacts with some Germans who were trying to make some uh, money in Bergen-Belsen by selling stuff. Yeah, uh, I mean, it was made it. It, was it, it, it did not arrive. It did not arrive there by accident. No, I mean, people had, you know, hoarded some things and eventually, not, but, you know, we learned to count on, on dead bodies. I mean, seeing dead bodies piled up in front of a barrack was as as common as seeing a television set in my house. Um, you know, that was just so much part yeah. of our lives. And um, you were there, uh, let me tell uh, again, uh, I'm paying the neck historian, but I'll fill in the details. In January, 1945, the Germans evacuated the camps that were in the in Poland, in, in occupied Poland, because they're afraid they would be overrun. They sent the uh, Jews and some other prisoners to German concentration camps, camps on German soil. And that meant that Bergen-Belsen, which had um, uh, X number of thousands of people, had four and five times that. Yeah. And that's the period of time in which the infrastructure of the camp broke down. It's a period of time when the typhus epidemic uh, broke out. And it's also ironically the period of time when Anne Frank and you were in in Bergen Belsen with Anne Frank, who came from Auschwitz. The period of time was she and Margot uh, both died in literally a month, a month and a half before liberation. So this is the the worst time, and Bergen Belsen was so bad that thirteen thousand people were died after liberation, despite heroic medical care. Uh, by the British. Let's yeah. spend a couple of minutes um, just taking it through the rest. You were, and, and ladies, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's an unfathomable. You're a four-year-old, you're a five-year-old, you're a six-year-old. The period of time in which childhood is supposed to be carefree and what, and, and fun. Um, what's your recollection of liberation? Well, you know, part of our story was that we ended up on the lost train. I mean, what happened is that Baron Belson, they tried to evacuate. They wanted to remove the evidence um, of this camp. And they, they had um, three trains that were, that were just overcrowded with skeletons, and many of them died along the way. And our train, because it was the end of the war, you know, the tracks were bombed and the Germans were trying to get soldiers back to the east. So our train meandered everywhere and was liberated by the Russian, the Soviet army in a small town called Trubitz after 13 days with hundreds of people dying. So we ended up in the small village, a farming village that had been evacuated. And I remember that the first night my parents you know, kind of took over this little house and the beds, you know, were all clean and down covers. And my parents, my mother gave us a bath. I mean, the first bath in over a year and then wanted us to sleep in the bed. And we refused to sleep in that bed because it said it's so white, you know, it was just something unfamiliar. Um, you know, it was, and Turbid, so it was in the spring, it was April. And I remember it was the first time I noticed trees and bloom and flowers. And anyone who knows me, you can see my jacket. Um, you know, it was my love affair with beautiful colors and nature. It was, it was like, you know, a new life. 
which wasn't all that easy for my family because when we came to back to Amsterdam, they were very unwelcome to you know German Jews um, coming back to Amsterdam. So that's a whole other story. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful that, and my brother isn't like that way. I mean, he may be watching and he would agree, you know. He's he, is, he, is, he is with us. <laughs> he's co he's, he's, comment he's commenting seen. from time to time. <laughs> you know, he's seen the cup as half empty. He was really very much affected and still is. And he, now he sees a repeat of history. Um, I always, I'm not really an optimist, but I have to have faith that life is, you only have one life to lead. You have to make it the best you can. And when all is said and done, I was, you know, blessed. I mean, look at all the people like me who was deserving to be on this program tonight and tell their story and never had the chance. So. You know, you have to be thankful. Marion, take us through for, we have a, a very brief period of time uh, left, but take us through, you, you, you and your family came to America. I mean, the inseparable really means you were inseparable. You came to America, and this also tells a little bit about your father's foresight, because your father, um, when he was comfortable and affluent, sent some money forward to America. Uh, so you did not come in the traditional, you know, rags, rags to riches. You didn't come in rags, but your father both had family here and had a little bit of money to begin his life. Yes, he did. And, you know, within a year, we bought a, a little, well, my parents bought a little house in Queens, an attached house, very, very humble. Uh, and, you know, I think it was like $17,000. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, his family almost resented it because my father was always the more successful and, you know, kind of entrepreneurial uh, child. And, you know, here they said, oh, you know, we're still living in a little apartment on the Upper West Side and, you know, you buy a little house. My parents were always extremely humble. I mean, I never remember going on a winter vacation or learning to play tennis. You know, the only important thing to my parents was that we would get a good education. Um, but it was, you know, it was still a rich life. And, and, and there's, a, there's a cute moment in which you, uh, uh, let me just add to a little bit of the flavor. Uh, number one, uh, when you came to visit, um, when you came to live on the Upper West Side, you came to live in Washington Heights, which was euphemistically known because of the prominence of German refugees right. there as the Fourth Reich or, or um, Hamburg, on Ham Hamburg on the Hudson, Frankfurt <laughs> on the Hudson. Uh, some of you will know it because Henry Kissinger's family went, right. went to live there. Uh, and it was, um, uh, and everybody who grew up there grew up in a uh, German um, a Jewish environment uh, strongly. But you describe your classroom, and then you describe uh, going into class. After all, you're a, a graduate of of, of Vesterbrook and uh, and of uh, Bergen Belsen, but you haven't quite had an education. You don't speak English. So tell us, uh, tell us about the movement along the school because that's one of the cute stories in, in the entire book. Well, by then we were nine years old and had really never gone to school. I think that we started a little Montes in a little Montessori school for a few months, but we'd never been to school. So this was a public school, uh, really almost right across the street from Columbia Presbyterian. And they started by putting us in kindergarten because we didn't speak English. And every few weeks, it was like a one-room schoolhouse. You know, there was only one room to each class. And every few weeks, they would open the sliding door um, and allow us to go into the next grade. And But I remember during that time, the first year, we were always invited, you know, to the mayor of Chinatown, to the United Nations, to 
um, other events and you know, somehow we felt like we were the show and tell Holocaust survivors and they made a big fuss about us. And it was very lovely, but I, I told my mother, I said, but you know, I think we should need to go to school. Um, and my mother said, um, well, it's, you know, in part that you're a Holocaust survivor and they want to honor you and, and see you, you know, kind of expose you to some of the enjoyable things in life. And I told my mother at the time, she always remembered it. And so she said, you know, I said, well, I don't always want to be a Holocaust survivor. I want to be an American girl. <laughs> and yeah. you know, that's always been a, a little bit of a duality. How much and, you had in the past. And, and, and you know, we grew up uh, um, in Queens at the same time. And lots of people in Queens at the same time. I grew up among children of refugees and children of survivors, um, all of whom wanted to Americanize. And it was very important to learn the language to fit in. And I remember as a kid, um, people in our community coming over to my father who was American and saying, take my son to a baseball game because he's got to be an American. And if I go to a baseball game, he's going to know how little I know. <laughs> and he's going to think of me as even more foreign, as it yeah. were. So Americanization was very, very important. And you went on to a very distinguished and wonderful career. Let's conclude this by asking you a tough question. Uh, you are now one of uh, being one of the youngest survivors you are now also one of the last survivors. And um, with this book, I think you're gonna feel a little bit of an added responsibility. And let's show the book and repeat the title one more time. Okay. It is called Inseparable, the uh, Hess Twins Holocaust Journey. And we have to say from Amsterdam to Vesterbrook to Bergen-Belsen, to the United States of America. It's been a hell of a journey and it's an incredibly well-told and well-researched journey. But tell us a little bit what you feel that responsibility is now, especially as you're part of the last generation. Yeah. Well, I certainly um, feel you know much more the compelling need uh, to remind people of our story, to tell the story. Um, you know, it's sad that when all of a sudden and done, we haven't learned the lesson and you look around the world and it doesn't have to be the Holocaust, but in other parts of the world, um, the, you know, the inhumanity to man, the, the haves and the have nots. I think it, you know, it just reminds us how important it is um, to, that every person wants to live a life that's meaningful. But, I'm so sorry. Um, to have a life where they see a future and a life that that has potential. I mean, I remember clearly that what it is to be looked at and treated as an animal, as, as someone who doesn't have a a spark of meaning and humanity. And I think that's something that we should all um, wish for. You know, of course, my special calling is my story because we're one of the few survivors. But it's also a broader lesson that the world, you know, the whole world has to learn about um, hatred and discrimination anti-Semitism and all the other isms. You know, it's important for us to focus on well, how- this Marion, you, your brother and Ferris have made a wonderful contribution. This is a book that you should read. Uh, it's a story, uh, I was asked in the, um, in the question and answer, how many families survived intact? One can't give you a percentage, one can't give you a number but one would have to say that it is unusual rather than usual. And uh, you certainly owe that to the um, efforts of both your parents 
And part of what we didn't get a chance to do was talk about the particular heroism of your mother and also the way in which um, she maneuvered her work and her uh, being in these camps in order to keep uh, an eye on the children and keep the children together. Yeah. And uh, this is a, a, a wonderful contribution. And this has been, um, uh, I don't want to say an enjoyable conversation, but an, a, a, an important conversation. I recommend the book strongly and uh, thank you very much. Let me turn it back to Suzanne. Great, thank you both so much for this very important conversation. Uh, Marion, thank you for sharing your story and, and I echo what Michael says about people buying the book. Again, it's inseparable. The Hess Twins Holocaust Journey Through Bergen Belsen to America. I put a link in the chat. When I send a follow-up email, I will include that as well. And I will add that um, in, ad in addition to telling your story, I think Ferris did an, a remarkable job of infusing it with history and facts and details. Um, so it's a really good uh, history book as well. Uh, Michael, thank you for providing all of the context, historical context for today's conversation. I wanna remind everybody, you can go to momentmag.com to sign up for our program next week on Israel, as well as uh, CL of our past programs. Again, Marion and Michael, thank you for sharing. Thank you to the audience for joining us and we'll see everybody next time. Thank you. And thank you. Bye -bye. Both of you. Very thank much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.